this song. God's got it. He's got it. Everything that we need. Everything. The thing that prevents us as mankind from entering into the place or the realm that God is trying to bring us all into is ourselves. We have limitations. There's only so far we can go. But I'm going to tell you, a change will happen in your life when you can get to the one that's able to change everything. There is some things are possible with man, but all things are possible when it comes to God. To them that believe. All you have to do is be willing to change, allow your mind to be changed. Allow the way you think to be changed. The Bible says we walk by faith and not by sight. So it's not all about what you can process in your thinking, in your mind when it comes to serving God. But in order for you to get to the next place in your life, it's going to require you to step beyond your comfort zone. To step beyond what makes you comfortable. We love to be comfortable. All of us as human beings. But I'm going to tell you, this song, this service has been so befitting for the message that God has put on my heart. Said a change is going to come. If you came here sick, you can leave here well. If you came here, your mind is bogged down with all type of junk. You can leave here with a new mind this morning. The title of this message is, is, is Until Change Happens. Until change happens in our lives, there's something that we should be doing to promote or cause that change to happen in our lives. Job said, he says, to all my appointed time, he said, I'm going to wait until my change come. He said, I'm going to wait until change happens in my life. So this morning I want to talk with you and we want to walk through this change process. What do we have to do? It's going to take some determination. It's going to take some grit. It's going to take a made up mind. It's going to require us getting outside of ourselves in order for God to bring us to the place that he's calling us to. While I have you stand, if you bow your heads with me as we go into a word of prayer. Dear God, in the name of Jesus, God, I thank you this morning. I thank you for those, God, that you have given a heart and mind to even be here with us this morning. Those that are watching online, God, it is all because of you. The fact that we even have the heart of the mind God, to even be here is because of you. God, we come here in your presence today. We don't come here, God, out of formality just to hear a word or just to come to church to do our weekly duty. But God, we want to be changed. God, empower us today. Give us faith, oh God, where our faith sometimes is weak. God, I pray that you would give us the strength sometimes, God, when we are weary and feel like giving up. God, I pray, God, that you would empower us through your word. God, I pray that you would bring encouragement, bring deliverance, bring understanding, God, to your people. God, we come here this morning. God, we recognize all that is happening around us. It is so much uncertainty. But, God, we know that everything that we need is in you. God, we want to be changed. Change us. Strengthen us. God, we know, God, you said, your word says, a leper cannot change his spots. Neither Ethiopian his skin color. Neither can he that is accustomed to doing evil do good. We cannot change ourselves. But we know that we can get in touch with you. You can change our circumstances. You can, can, change, you can change the condition of our lives. God, we need you. God, I ask God that you would have free course this morning. Give me the wisdom. I submit myself completely to you. Speak to our hearts this morning, God. We come here, God, as babes, Lord, as your children. 
God, we just want to sit at your feet and hear words from your mouth. Feed us, oh God. Nourish us. Meet us where we are. And God, we be careful to give you all the praise, all the glory, and all the honor. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated if you can. So again, I just want to thank you for this is your first time visiting with us or your first time watching us online. We want to thank you for joining us and being a part of what we're doing. And Pastor Mark shared with you a lot of the things that our ministry, what we're all about. But we truly, our name is a reflection of what we're about, and that's changing lives. And I know that I know enough that I'm limited and I know that if a man or a woman, I don't care what situation or set of circumstances you may be dealing with in your life, if you can get in touch with God, you can get in touch with Jesus, a change will happen in your life. It's not if, it's not maybe, a change will happen. But until you, you've got, we've got to be determined as people and I think all of us, if we do a self-check or self-evaluation and be honest with ourselves, we can identify where we are. And when we see what God's word says about us or concerning us, even the way we think about a particular situation, circumstances that we're dealing with, how to move beyond it, how to endure it, how to come through it when it seems impossible. We see oftentimes what God's word says but sometimes it just seems like the situation is just too dismal. It's impossible for change to happen. And sometimes we want change to happen immediately. But we've got to take the mindset as Job and we're going to wait. And we're going to do the, have the due diligence and do the necessary things until that change happens in our lives. We live in a society where we want things instantaneously. You know, we have microwave popcorn. You put it in. You all, you, they even made the microwave now where you don't even have to put the time in. You just hit popcorn on the microwave and it pops your popcorn. They've expedited everything. Everything that, you, that we do, they, it's, it's a quicker way. Computers are getting faster and faster because people don't even like to wait for the Internet to come up. If the computer slows down a split second, you say, my computer is dragging. We don't like to wait. But when it comes to situations in our lives, God brings us to a place to where we can only go so far. And in order for change to happen, it requires us waiting on him. And allowing him to intervene, but we've got to wait until we connect with the one that is able to change our situation. So what do we do? Do we just sit and just wait? What does waiting look like? We're going to talk about that. Do we just wait and say, God, well, I'm in this situation. I'm just going to trust you. Well, we'll see what that looks like today. That's something that we have to do as Christians, and it's something that our faith will cause each one of us to do. You know, as they were singing that song about a change, you know, I reflect oftentimes about Israel when Israel was in Egypt and God charged Moses to free his people. And when Moses went in there, he just, his faith was limited. He was weary. He didn't know how he was going to be able to go up against a the strongest and the most mightiest army in the world at that time. And all he had was a staff. And God told him that he was going to use him to free his people. And God did everything that he said that he was going to do. But it came to a point as they were coming out, they came to a, a pit stop. They came to a point where they could go no further. Pharaoh's army was behind them, and there was a Red Sea in the front of them. We're going to be brought to our Red Sea experience. 
where we know what God is telling us and what God has promised through his word, but it seems like there's pit stops, there's roadblocks, there's challenges along the way. But God told Moses to be still, and he's going to see the salvation of the Lord. And God opened up that Red Sea, and they went through on dry ground. God showed his power. That was not just for Israel, but that's for us today. That's for us to know that when we come to him, it, it, so it seems like there's a red sea in the front of us. It seems like the challenge is just too difficult for us to be able to overcome. We know. If, I want you to know if you can get in touch with the one that was able to open up that red sea, he can make a change in your life today. So what does that mean we have to do? We've got to stop limiting him. And when we come to him, we need to come to him with expectation, knowing that the one that has a solution and the one that can bring resolve or deliverance or change in my life, he has given me the opportunity to be able to come to him and he can change my life. With that said, what should our attitude be moving forward? What should our minds be moving forward? We should never come to a place where we're willing to give up and throw in the towel. Where we just give up on life, where we give up on church, where we give up on God. Because it seems like life has thrown something at us so overwhelming that it just brings us to a point where we just should fold and throw in the towel. But I'm going to tell you, not so when it comes to the people of God. Not so to somebody that wants something greater, that wants to move beyond where they are. God is calling you to something greater in your life. But I'm going to tell you, until you're willing to change and begin to do three things differently, your circumstances will never change. We want change with no change in us. You want God to bless you. You want God to change your circumstances. But you, you won't change anything that you're doing. So when you change and start to respond to what God's word has said through faith, you're going to start to see circumstances in your life change. Hallelujah. So until change happens, what are we going to do? Open up your Bibles. Let's go here to Jeremiah. Chapter 29, I'm going to start reading it from verse 13. This is God. He says, and you shall seek me and find me when you search for me with some of your heart. He says, you shall seek me and you shall find me when you search for me with all of your heart. Now, if you want God in your life, if you want to get in touch with God, you want an experience with God, you need deliverance in your life. You know that the, the, the choices that you have made sometimes put us in precarious situations. But in order for God's divine intervention in our lives, it requires us to start to do some seeking. It requires us to start to do some searching. And not just with a part of us, but with our whole heart. God does not want a part of you or a part of me. He wants all of us. You know, I was reflecting this week, and you know, we oftentimes, you know, no, I don't think nobody says they don't love God. They claim that's a believer. I think we all say we love God. But if you are in any relationship, you measure, you, want, you measure love. Oftentimes, the husband will just look at the wife and say, how much you love me? Or the wife may look at the husband and say, how much? Do you really love me? Yeah, I love you. How much do you love me? This is just natural tendencies that people have. Well, God has a measurement of love as well. And he tells us how much we should love him. He tells, we should, he tells us we should love him with all of our heart, all of our soul, all of our minds and all of our strength. So God wants all of us. 
But when you begin to set aside your mind, your desires, your wants, how you think things should happen in your life, and begin to seek him with your whole heart, he says, you're going to find me. Now, when you begin to do this, we'll see there's going to be some challenges along the way. There's going to be some things that's trying to stop you and preventing you from progressing and moving forward and entering into the place where God is trying to bring you to. But it's going to require some tenacity on our part. Let's look at this word tenacity. And I gave them that definition. It's the quality or fact of being able to grip something firmly. The quality or fact of being very determined. Determination. So what's going to be required for change to happen in all of our lives? There's going to have to be some tenacity on our part. You can't just be a fair weather Christian. You can't just do what's convenient for you. You've got to be willing to get outside of your comfort zone and do some things that's currently unconvenient for you to do. And you've got to be determined. Because guess what? Circumstances, issues of life are still happening all around you. I've seen where people, they need God in their lives. And I'm going to tell you something. The enemy going to come and throw anything at your way. Some people trip over a stick. Some people trip. You know, you, you know I was a running back, and there was some, sometimes, very few times, when I was running and I just fell. And they said, man, you tripped on a blade of grass. Some people are tripped just on a blade of grass. Some people are tripped when anything come their way. They was, they was determined they was going to come to church, begin to do things differently in their lives, give their life to God, do things the right way, repent, turn away from their sins, turn away from things that they recognize don't bring them peace, don't bring them joy, don't bring them fulfillment in their life. And as they're pursuing, they trip over a blade of grass. But if you trip over a blade of grass, get yourself back up. If you tripped over a limb, get back up. See, when you're determined and when you have tenacity, it does not mean that you did everything right the first time. What it means is this here, I'm not going to stop fighting. I'm not going to stop pushing. I'm not going to stop seeking and searching until I get what I'm looking for. But oftentimes we stop when things become inconvenient. But you got to have some grit. You got to grab a hold of God's word and say, I'm not going to let go. You got to grab a hold of God's promises, what God has said in his word, and say, I'm not going to turn it loose on this time until a change begins to happen in my life. So stop letting go. Sometimes... You know, there's a, 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 a process and there's time that, and God knows what to bring us through. But oftentimes we abort the process and we give up when things begin to become a little challenging along the way. But don't give up. Don't give up. Let's go here to Matthew chapter 7. And this is Jesus writing. He's telling us this here. He says, ask and it shall be given you. Seek and you shall find. He says, knock and it shall be opened unto you. For everyone that ask it, receive it. And he that seek it, find it. And to him that knock it, it shall be open. Now, I want you to wrap your mind around this for one moment. He's telling you, if you ask, it shall be given. Seek and you shall find. Knock and it shall be open unto you. Now you may say, well, God, I asked you for this and I asked you for X, Y, Z and nothing happened. You know, I sought, I, I sought you, Lord, but nothing didn't happen. But you got to define and you got to understand truly what asking looks like or what seeking looks like or what knocking looks like. Let me, let me tell you, ask you one question. If you're trying to get in touch with somebody and they have something that's very valuable to you, do you just call them one time on the phone and say, I tried to get in touch with you, but I just couldn't get you, and you just stop right there? 
No, you call, you email, you text, you send messages. You do whatever you got to do to get in touch with the one who you're trying to get the valuable thing from. Have you ever gone to somebody's house and they told you they were at home? Come over here. They ha- I got a package for you. And you get to the house and you're knocking and they didn't answer the door. Do you say, well, I knocked. And you didn't come to the door after the first time. And you, when you knock, you. Well, I knocked. They didn't come. Well, you know. No, if there's something in there that you want. You go. I know he in there. He must be asleep. He in there. Let me go around and tap on his window. His room is in the back. You go through the gate, around the house on the back side. Some of y'all can identify what I'm talking about go around the house to the back side. Now you're tapping on the window. You say, man, he's still asleep. He must have took some sleep aid. You call somebody. Man, I know John at the house. I can't get him. He in there. Well, you can call Susie, his daughter there, his daughter at the house. Call her. I got a number. You got a number? Yeah, I got a number. Give me her number. You call her. Hey, I'm trying to get your daddy. Can you go? When he sleep, wake him up. He know I'm coming. This is what we do. So when we are asking, when you are seeking, when you are knocking, it don't just stop at one time. You don't stop until you get what you are expecting and what God has promised you in his word. So it takes some tenacity. It takes some willingness and some determination in your mind and in your heart not to give up. You don't give up so easily when it comes to certain things that you want. So he's telling us, and and he's saying, everything that you need, I have it. All you have to do is ask. All you have to do is seek. Have you ever been seeking for something? You lost your keys, and you're looking for your keys. Do you just go look in one place? Well, I looked, I looked in the drawer. It wasn't there. And you can't move until you get your keys. Man, I tore my whole house up looking for the keys. Because I was seeking. I wasn't looking in one spot, in one area. I was determined until I found my keys. What I'm trying to tell you is this here. Sometimes in seeking and knocking, these are some of the most valuable times in our lives as Christians. Because what it does is as we're seeking, as we're knocking, we're building a relationship with him. And God is strengthening you at that time. He's building your faith. He's touching you in places where he hadn't touched you before. Now you're in his presence. Now you're communicating with him on a regular basis. Now you come to the point where you're at a dead-end road and say, I don't have nowhere else to go. The only place I have is right here, and I can't stop knocking. I can't stop seeking. I can't stop asking until I get what I came for from God. So he brings us to that place. He says, for everyone that asks is received. He's telling us everyone. I want you to think about what you need. I want you to think about what issues or problems that you have. He says, everyone that asks is received. And he that seek it, find. So I can find God? Yes, you can. What I need, I can be delivered? Oh, yes, you can. Just start knocking. Just start seeking. And he says, and to him that knock it, it shall be open. Hallelujah. Let's go here to Luke 18. And this here is a clear example of somebody that was seeking, that was asking, that was knocking, and was not going to take no for an answer until she got what she needed. That's many of us are familiar with this parable here. And Jesus is talking about the parable of the widow woman. 
And this woman, if you know, you look at back at Israel's time, when a husband died, a man died, and she was left alone, her resources oftentimes were very limited. And there was a, a huge act of compassion. That's why God put in his word, always to be considerate and thoughtful of the widow, of the fatherless, because their resources were very limited. And if you know, if you know even in days, I tell my wife, you know, you know, she may call in different contractors or try to get certain work done. And I'm, and I'm, and I'm not saying all contractors are, are this way. But when they hear a female coming, or well, mechanics, some mechanics, they see a female coming, they figure they can get a little bit more because of their lack of knowledge and understanding of certain things when it comes to that line of work. So they will be oftentimes taken advantage of. But here's this widow woman that was a judge, and she needed, her, she needed to be avenged of her adversary. Now, it does not say exactly what, is, what the adversary did to her, but we all have an adversary. If you got everybody, you get along. You say, oh, you know, I don't have any enemies. Oh, yes, you, have a, you, got, a, you got the devil out there. So we all have an enemy in some shape, form, or fashion. And we all have things that have plagued us or that transpired that has happened to us. And sometimes, you know, God does not want us trying to fight our own battles. He does not, he does not want us trying to bring resolve to situations the way that we know how. God wants us to depend and trust him. So here this woman here was in this situation. And she began to go to this judge. And he spake a parable unto them to this end, that men ought always to pray and not faint. Now, the key to until change happens, you're going to have to become an individual that learned to call on God. I don't care where you are. You may not have been uh, uh, in church. You may not be serving God. But if you can begin to cry and call on God from a sincere heart, God will begin to hear you. I remember as I began, I needed God to help me. I was in a situation. I was at a crossroad, and I knew I could not go any further in my life. I was miserable. I, my life was unfulfilled. And I said, God, I need you. And what I began to do, I remember it was my last year of undergrad, and I sat in the computer lab. And I would type on that computer, and I was writing God a letter, telling him how much I wanted to serve him. Now, I didn't know I was praying, but I was. I was describing it, but I was speaking from my heart what I needed God to do for me. See, sometimes you may be not be in a setting, be in an environment where you can be in the house of prayer, but you can call on God while you're going down the road. You can call on God while you're at your job. You're in a situation where you just you feel like you're about to lose your mind. You can call on him. You can write God a letter. Whatever it takes, but I needed God to move in my life. And so this woman began to go to the one who had the power to change her situation. This judge in this city was the only one that was able to change her situation. She had nowhere else to go. She had nowhere else to turn. Some of us have come to a place. Some of you are at a place. You don't have nowhere else to turn. You have exhausted all means, all know-how to change situations in your life. But God is saying, I'm still here. I'm standing right here. So we have to do what this woman did. And he spake this parable unto them to this end, that men ought always pray. Pray when you've been bad? Yes. Pray when it seems like everything is good? Yes. Always pray and not faint. So what this is letting us know, if we are praying, if we're calling on him, if we're communicating with God, we'll be strengthened and we won't give up. The Bible talks about in Proverbs, it says, if we faint in our day of adversity, it says our strength is small. Sometimes you become weak when you're just focused on your situation and trying to figure out how to change it, and you're so overwhelmed with anxiety and worry to the point you can't pray. 
But you know what prevents us from praying in situations like that? Because you have in your mind what you want this to look like. You have in your mind how you want this to go. You have in your mind, you're determined that you want it to look like X, Y, Z. And you don't want to risk the, the, risk the opportunity or risk the chance of going to God and God tells you to do something differently. But you got to be willing to change. Oftentimes, you stay in the same place and you run around in circles and circles because you're not willing to change. But when you, be, when you start praying, when you start getting in touch with God, a change will begin to happen in your life. So he says, there was in a city a judge which feared not God, neither regarded man. So here's the judge. He's the only one that's able to assist this woman. He was not God-fearing. And he had no regard for man. That's saying, could nobody tell him nothing? He had his own mind. And here, this woman says, but he can change my situation. And look what she does. And there was a widow in that city, and she came unto him saying, avenge me of mine adversary. And he would not for a while. He wouldn't respond to her. She was asking him. She was petitioning him. She was giving him, I can only imagine, giving him the whole line of events, trying to get him to have some sense of compassion. But she wasn't dealing with somebody that was compassionate and had regard for mankind and had no fear for God, but he still had the power to change her situation. So she had no other means. So she said, I don't have nowhere else to go. I got to stay right here. He probably stonewalled her when she came the first time and said, I don't want to hear what you have to say. And he would not for a while. So when that court opened it back up, court probably opened up at about, what time the courts typically open? Eight o'clock? Eight o'clock, Monday morning. She was right back right there. Here I am again, judge, waiting on him. He denied her again. Tuesday morning, eight o'clock, she was right back there sitting on that old bench, waiting on him. Here I am again, judge. Thursday came. She was right back sitting on that bench. Eight o'clock Thursday morning. Why? She had nowhere else to go. She did everything she could. So guess what? I'm not going anywhere until you change my situation. So he for a while denied her. But look what the Bible says. Though he says, let's go back to verse 4. He says, and he would not for a while, but after he said within himself, though I fear not God, nor regard man, yet because this widow troubled me, I will avenge her, lest by her continual coming she weary me. One thing he came to understand was she wasn't going nowhere. She wasn't going to quit. She wasn't going to let up on him. She was going to be there every day until a change happens. Now, what has Jesus given us this parable for? What is he trying to let us know? Let's go on a little bit further. And he says, and the Lord said, hear what the unjust judge said, and shall not God avenge his own elect, which cries sometime, which cried day and night unto him though he be along with him. So what he's letting us know is this here. If that unjust judge that had no fear of God or no regard for man understood that this woman would trouble him and trouble him until she got the resolve that she was looking for, he said, do you hear what the unjust judge says? Now, our father, our loving God, is concerned about us. Will he not hear? Will he not avenge us? Will he not move for us when we cry in day and night unto him? What he's letting us know is this here. And what he's letting you know is this. If I could just get before God, if I could just call on God. Yeah, I made, I went to the altar. Yeah, I got in my closet. I was crying to him when I went down the road and I did that on Monday. But don't just do it. Don't just stop at Monday. Continue with Tuesday. Continue. Say, here I am again, Lord. When you are coming to him, why are you coming to him like that? You will say, well, I asked him one time, and, you know, I mean, I'm just going to have faith. 
No, your faith is what keeps you going back. It is your faith that keeps you going back. It is your faith that's got you knocking. But oftentimes we say, well, I asked. You know, I asked the Lord. But what does your ask look like? Does your ask look like this widow woman? If it does not look like this widow woman, you're not asking the right way. So we continue and we come before him. And don't you know, during these times, God is not only, how does he move for us? He's ministering to you. He's teaching you. He's working things out of you and he's working things inside of you. He's bringing peace inside of you. He's giving you wisdom on how to manage a situation. He's, he's, he's calming you down. He's giving you what you can just, you're willing to let the situation go and just trust him. When you are, and what's happening, you are building a relationship with him. Don't just stop after one time. Sometimes you can have things in your life. There's been things that have been bothering me. I've been tempted. Thoughts have hit my mind. The enemy, I know the enemy is attacking me. There's times when I've been offended and I've been hurt. How I manage that hurt is very important. How I manage that temptation is very important. When you're dealing with situations like that and you need help and you need assistance beyond yourself, you, you try to do it your way and you're still having an issue. What do you do? I've had to go in my closet and cry out to God and say, God, you've got to deliver me. God, you've got to help me. God, I don't like the way that I feel when I see this individual that hurt me change my heart change my mind and when I come out of the closet I thought I, I thought I tapped in I thought I was good I felt good but when I saw the individual and I got grieved on the inside I knew I wasn't where I needed to be so guess what I had to I had to go back in my closet and start back knocking again why because I've got to continue until I get what I need from the one that is able to change my heart but oftentimes we recognize things about us, things that's working inside of us, and we ignore it. Don't ignore it. Do something about it. I've had to go back sometimes three times, four times, until I recognized I got the deliverance or the change that I was expecting. This is how it happens. Don't walk around. You don't have to pack issues, pack problems, pack burdens unnecessarily. When you come before God, don't stop until you get the answer or the resolve that you're looking for. Until a change happens. Let God do it in your life. And he says, I tell you, he will avenge them speedily. Sometimes it seems like it may take a long time. But it, you know what? Oftentimes it makes the things drag out and seem like it's taking a long time. and seem like things are not happening. It's because... We do things in spurts. You come to church, you pray one time, you felt pretty good, and you just stop right there. And you say, you know what, God, I did. I felt pretty good, but my situation hadn't changed. No, he don't want you stopping right there with one time. He wants you to continue and continue. Sometimes you can be dealing with anger. Dealing with lust, dealing with pride, dealing with unforgiveness, whatever it is. Dealing, you need a healing in your life. Whatever it is, battles in your mind. There may be sometimes, there might, may not be things you engaged in, but your mind is still being plagued and battled with the thoughts to do it. What do you have to do? You don't play with those things. You don't play with that situation. You go to God with expectation and with tenacity and with determination until change happens in your life. Don't stop at one time. You know, I've seen, I've experienced it myself. And sometimes when you see things and you reckon, recognize things about you that are not right, and maybe you have a trigger point, and you know, as you know, a person did this to you and you responded this way, and it triggered something in you. And the worst thing to do at that time is to put the blame on the person that caused you to respond in an ungodly way. Amen. The worst thing for you to do 
is to point the blame and, the, and, and, and allow your focus to be on the person and what they did to you that caused you to respond in a wrong way. In order for you to change, the only way you're going to change, you have got to hone in and focus on yourself and how you responded and what you did. Jesus said it like this in one passage. He said, either make the tree good and its fruit good or the tree corrupt and its fruit corrupt. He said, for the tree is known by its fruit. He said, you, can, you, you can't take you can't say, you know what, if bad things are coming out of you, you got to call yourself a bad tree. You can't say, well, you know what, all you're doing is you lashing out, you cursing, you're angry, you're you finding something, some drugs, some alcohol to, 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 to bring some uh, comfort to your situation. You can't say, well, you know, I'm, but I'm a good person. You know, really I am. Deep down inside, I'm a good person. You know, if everything else was different around me, I'd be a good person. Uh Uh-uh. You can't wait for the environment to dictate you be good. You got to start on the inside and work and allow God to work on your heart for you to become good. Jesus said, he said, he prayed to the Father. He said, Father, I pray not that you take them out of the world. He said, but that you keep them from the evil thereof. He says, sanctify them in thy truth. Thy word is truth. So God is not going to take us out of this world until he brings Carlos home to glory. So while you are in this world, in this environment, there's going to be some temptation. There's going to be some things that hit up against your house. There's going to be some things that you got to deal with, problems that you have. But guess what? Our trials allow us to see precisely where we are. And when the fire, when the flame, when the heat brings things to surface that's inside of you, that's showing you what's working inside of you, don't focus on the thing. Don't focus on the person that did it. Focus on what's coming out of your heart at that time. And say, God, I got something to pray about. I have something to ask God about. Man, we all have something to ask God about something. I look at my life and I'm always trying to figure out and see how I can be better. Things about me, my personality, tendencies that I recognize hold me back. I want to focus on those areas. So guess what? Don't blame the person. You know, you can't take an orange and squeeze it and get apple juice out of it. I don't care how hard you squeeze an orange. Apple juice is not coming out of that orange because it's an orange. So when we are being squeezed, what's coming out of you determines what you are and what I am. Some of the best times in my salvation has not been when I felt like I was on the mountaintop. But the best times in my salvation, when God allowed me to see things inside of me that wasn't right. And when my heart and mind was to go to him sincerely and ask him to free me and deliver me on the inside. And when you experience that deliverance, When you experience that change, there's nothing greater than that. Let me tell you something. When you get in touch with God that way, I don't care what somebody has done to you. Let me tell you, when you know God, change has happened. I don't care what somebody has done to you and how it made you feel on the inside. When you get to God the right way and when you acknowledge where you are and you allow God to begin to work on you and free you from the inside, what they did becomes irrelevant to you in your life. Becomes irrelevant. You ain't even mad at them. You forgive them. But why? He tells us to forgive. He tells us to love our enemy. He tells us to bless them that curse us. So guess what we have to do in our prayer? 
when, we, when we're being tenacious about doing the right thing and allowing a change to begin to happen in our hearts and minds. These are the things that we implement while we're in praying when we're dealing with these situations. These are not just good words that our Lord and Savior is giving us, but he's instructing us on what we should do. So when you go to him, go to him with the mind that he's going to and know that he can change your heart. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let's go here to Luke 22. And many of us know the situation with Jesus when he recognized, when he knew he had to be offered up and he was preparing to go and he knew everything that awaited him. But we'll see how his tenacity and how his willingness and his determination to carry out what his father had commanded him to do. And this is not just for Jesus, but this is to be our mindset and our mentality. Because guess what? We'll see in the scripture, Jesus did not just feel like going on the cross. He wasn't, it wasn't something that he just had excitement to do. He knew what awaited him. He knew he was going to be humiliated. He knew the pain that was going to be associated with him laying down his life. But for the joy that was before him, the Bible says he endured that cross. He despised the shame. And, but we'll see here what he did until his mind changed. So we'll see. He says, and when he was, this is Luke 22, verse 40. And when he was at the place, he said unto them, Pray ye that you enter not into temptation. Now, he's telling his disciples to pray. And he was withdrawn from them about a stone's cast, and he kneeled down and prayed. Jesus prayed. Man, you'll read throughout the Scripture where Jesus will go up into the mountains and pray all day and all night. And this is what we are, our desire for this church to be. We want to be a church of prayer, people of prayer. So he prayed. And he got down and he began to pray. He said, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Does that sound like some of us at times? You know what God is, you know what you need to do and what's required to do, but it just seemed so hard. And you say, God, just move it out the way. Just move it, Lord. But if God is not willing to move it and his desire is for you to go through it, you don't alter, you don't change, you pray and you do the necessary things until your mind, your will lines up with God's will. Our prayer and our heart and our mind should be that our will lines up with his will. So when it's not your desire, when it's not your, your, your intent or it's not something that you want to do, we pray until our will, our desires line up with his says, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup. But he says, nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. So what we have to say, we, we, there's nothing wrong with saying, Lord, move the situation out of the way. But we got to say, but nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. And there appeared an angel from heaven, heaven strengthening him. And when you read in the other gospel, if you read in Matthew and, 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 and Mark, the Bible says this went on three times. He prayed. He got up. He went back to check on his disciples. They were asleep. He said, I need you to pray with me. He went back a second time, and he began praying again, the same thing. He got up, went, checked on his disciples. They was falling asleep again. He said, I need you to pray with me. Can you not pray and watch with me for one hour? He went back the third time, and he began to pray again, the same thing. And the angel of the Lord came and began to strengthen him. And when he came out of prayer that last time, his will, his desire was in alignment with God's will, with his father's will. Look at what happened, but look, but look at what was happening to him while he was praying. He says, and being in agony... He prayed more earnestly. 
See, when you got pain on you and when you're suffering and this situation is so hard, you don't just give up and say, well, it's just too overwhelming for me, God. He was in pain. He was in agony when he was down there. But the Bible says he prayed more earnestly. He prayed with more determination. He prayed with more tenacity. He prayed with more grit. He said, God, I'm not going ch- to get up until my desires line up with yours. Why was he toiling? What was the agony? Because he knew the situation, what he had fathomed in his mind, what he conceptualized in his mind. It was not what he had a desire to go through. But he said, I see what my father is requiring of me. And the pain was, Lord, I don't want to have to suffer that. I don't want to have to go without that. I don't want to have to be by myself. I don't want to have to suffer and go without. I don't want to look like I'm nobody when I always had a desire to look like I had everything in in control in my life. And the struggle is real sometimes. But it's okay if the struggle is real. But you can pray and stay there until change happens. Now, let me tell you something about change. Change does not happen necessarily when everything around you look different. Change happens when your mind, when your will lines up with his will. And when that happens, you're going to start to see something in your life. You're going to start to see a change begin to happen all, happen all around you. But it first starts with you on your knees. Some of you right now have been challenged. And some of you right now have been dealing with the same things for a long time. And your faith is holding you back. A lack of faith is holding you back. But it's time to say, God, I'm not going to stop. I'm going to pray in pain, in agony, through my suffering period until a change happens. Let me tell you this here. Sometimes I've seen this in even my own experience. I had a very bad drug habit, alcohol habit, woman habit. I had those things. And when you come to God, when you give your life to God, and when, you, when you've been accustomed to engaging in these things, your flesh has memory. Your flesh has memory. In your heart, in your mind, you're ready to go on and serve God. But that body starts calling. That flesh starts tugging at you. And what you have to do at that time, you don't give in to the flesh. You pray until Change happens. You stay there while you're suffering, while you are uncomfortable, and it only lasts for a short period of time, and you're able to get up and go on in God. But what happens oftentimes, the enemy will tell you, see, man, you're still dealing with that. You, 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 see, you still didn't see so you ain't, no, God hadn't done anything for you. You might as well go on and just re-engage and tap back into it again. no. I'm going, and guess what? That's, that's, that battle is happening in your mind. But what I'm going to do, I'm not going to give in to my flesh. I'm going to get down on my knees and I'm going to pray until my desires and until my will line up with his. Hallelujah, Lord. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. And his sweat was as it were great drops of blood falling to the ground. He was sweating profusely. So we see here he got up and he was able to go on and carry out what God had called for him to do. But it did not happen without him being determined. Now, he was knocking. He was seeking. And he was asking until change happened. Last passage here. And this is in Genesis 32. And this is the story of with Jacob. And you had Jacob and Esau, twin brothers. And we know that Esau sold his birthright for a morsel of meat. He sold his birthright. He gave it up to fulfill his flesh. 
And Jacob desired the things of God, but we know that Jacob went about, the, went about it the wrong way to obtain it. He was deceitful. He was a little trickster. And so when his father, he went in disguised as his brother Jacob so his father could bless him, and all the inheritance and all the blessings would come to Jacob. But in actuality, Esau gave it up. And so when Esau found out that Jacob had been blessed of his father, he became very angry with him and said, he stole my birthright. We know he didn't steal it. But still, Jacob went about getting it the wrong way. He was deceitful in his efforts. And it came to a point where God was ready to bless Jacob. He had promised that his seed from Abraham, Isaac, that will continue through Jacob would be as the sand of the seashore. But in order for him to move forward in his life, he had to go back and get it right with his brother. And Jacob was more of a mama's boy. You know, he stayed in the house and he learned little things from his mother. He wasn't, and his brother Esau was a hunter, a strong man, a hairy man. He'd go out there and shoot antelope and deer and hunt. He was rugged. So he knew that he couldn't beat him. His brother had beat him in the womb. So he knew he couldn't beat him. But God is telling him, you got to go back and get this thing right with your brother if I'm going to continue to bless your life. There's certain things that seems very hard and challenging that God is calling for us to do. But in order for us to move forward, you've got to go and do what God is telling you and you got to get certain things right to move forward. Now, he was, he, in his mind, his life was in jeopardy because the last thing he heard his brother had vowed when their father died that he was going to kill him. And now God is telling him, go and meet your brother. So what Jacob did, Jacob began to get on the road, head towards his brother. And God had blessed Jacob, and he had servants and men servants and maid servants, and he had cattle. He had, he had an excess, and he began to send cattle and send gifts ahead of them to his brothers to try to, in his mind, appease the anger. And as they began to go forward, and they came and they met, met his brother, and he told him that Jacob was coming. But he wanted you to have these gifts. Esau sent word back and said, well, I'm going to go and meet him. And when Jacob's service got back to meet him, he said, your brother is on his way with 400 men with him. He said, Jacob said, oh, Lord. <laughs> so he started trying to figure out what to do. So he said, I tell you what, he says, he split up the people. He split up the servants and his family into two groups. He said, well, if he come and, he, and they, they, they get one group, kill one, the other can get away. You know, that's, that's how it is. God tells us to do something. Now, now, God knew and he had promised Jacob that he was going to be with him. But he just telling him, you got to go and get this thing right. But in his mind, it looks like it's death to him. In his mind, he on a suicide mission. Sometimes some of you feel like to do what God is telling you to do, that you are on a suicide mission, and you're not. The devil was telling him, boy, you about to get it now. So what he did, he, he, he split the group. Then he said he sent another, he sent his service again to him with animals with gifts to try to appease him. And his brother was still coming. He didn't get, he was waiting on word to come back that everything was all right, but he didn't get word. And Jacob began to pray. He said, Father, oh Lord, he began to tell him that I'm scared. I need you to help me. 
God, I know what you're calling me to do. I know what you're asking of me to do, but I'm scared. You know, sometimes uns- the uncertain, the unknown, fear can overwhelm us and take us out. But he let God know that he was scared. Sometimes it's okay to let him know that you're scared. God, I'm scared. God, I don't know what to expect. I need you to help me. And that night, let's look here. An angel of the Lord came to him. And when he saw, let's go here to verse, I got 25. I wanted to go back a little bit further, but so he came in contact with this angel and he had already prayed his prayer. And he says, and when he saw that he prevailed not against him, he touched the hollow of his thigh. Now, what happened was he grabbed a hold of this angel and a wrestling match started to go on. It's just like Jesus was wrestling when he was praying in that in that garden. Jacob grabbed this this angel, this angelic being, because he felt and he knew that he could change the situation that he was dealing with. And he grabbed a hold to him. And he began to wrestle with him. And the Bible said he was prevailing. He was winning. And day was approaching. And he was trying to get loose and get back. And look at what Jacob says. He says, he prevailed not against him. He touched the hollow of his thigh, and the hollow of Jacob's thigh was out of joint as he wrestled with him. So he's wrestling with him, and he can't get free from him. And he hit Jacob in the thigh and knocked his his thigh out of joint. Can you imagine that amount of pain? But look at what Jacob said. He says, He said, let me go for the day breaking. And he said, I will not let you go except you bless me. He was wrestling with him. He was in pain. He had one leg. And the pain was real. But he said, I'm not going to let you go except you bless me. What we have got to do when we are in these type of precarious situations and when you are calling on God, when you're in the midst of pain, when you're in the midst of suffering, when you're going through heartache, when you're going through pain in your life, when you got to grab a hold of God, grab a hold of God's promises and say, I'm not going to let you go except you bless me. The pain sometimes causes people to let go. The pain sometimes caused people to just give up and say, what's the use? But Jacob's mentality was, I'm not going to let you go except you bless me. And look what he says to him. And he said unto him, what is thy name? He said, Jacob. He says to him, thy name shall be called no more Jacob, but Israel. As a prince has thy power with God and with men, and has prevailed. He changed his name from, which meant deceiver, slickster, conniver. He recognized Jacob was determined to do this thing the right way. He was going to hold on to God. He was not going to be deceitful and try to carve out his own way, but he grabbed a hold to God and said, I'm not going to let you go until you bless me. He said, you're no no longer a deceiver. He said, Jacob, you have tapped into something. You've tapped into something else that's far greater than your means to bring you deliverance, a change in your life. He He says, your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel. For as a prince, you have power with God and with men and have prevailed. He was able to prevail. Because he was unwilling to give up. He was able to prevail because he said, I'm not going to stop. I'm not going to give up until change happens in my life. What I want to encourage you this morning and want to let you know and remind you today. This message God is bringing to all of us today is to let us know. Stop looking at your circumstances. Stop thinking that it's too hard for God. Nothing is too hard for God. If you could just be determined, knock, 
seek, ask, hold on while you're painting, while you're suffering. Change is going to happen in your life. Stand on your feet, everybody.